Hello, I'm Robert Lovelace, and this is the twelfth of seventeen episodes of a work called Ten Nights in the Black Lion, which was written by the novelist Daniel Owen in 1859. It was originally written as a serial in a magazine called Charles Abella, which had been produced by his friend Nathaniel Jones, but was now edited by John Davis. This twelfth episode was published on the 25th of August, 1859. This episode was also poorly edited and laid out without any punctuation for speech marks. Episode 12. The Sixth Evening. Mr. Harrison, for that's the name that Matthew the bartender had called him by, stood by the bar of the Black Lion for a few minutes, looking undecided. He was sure that he had seen his sons come into the pub, and yet he couldn't find them. He sat in a quiet corner in the bar room, undoubtedly with the intention of waiting to see if his boys would appear. He hadn't been there long before two other young men came in. His presence seemed to greatly upset them. They went up to the bar and called for liquor. As Matthew placed the drinks before them, he leaned over the counter and whispered something in their ears. Where? one of the young men asked in awe, as they looked excitedly round the room. They met Harrison's fiery eyes fixed upon them. I could see they were not enjoying drinking their brandy and water under his stern gaze. What the devil does he want here? said one in a low voice. After his boys, of course. Are they here? Matthew winked in reply. Everything's fine, he said. In number four? Yes, and the wine and cigars are waiting for you. That's okay. It might be better if you don't go through the parlour. Old man Harrison suspects they are in the house somewhere. You'd better go out to the road and through the passage to the back door, said Matthew. At that suggestion the two went out. Harrison glanced over but ignored them. He stayed in that same seat for nearly an hour watching closely everything that took place. I suspect he was beginning to think that that cursed place was a good reason to make a law against the intoxicating trade. I believe that if he had had the means in his hand to end the damning trade instantly, no pub would have been found in all the province within the hour. Harrison was still in the bar room when Willie Hammond came in. Willie looked wild and overexcited. He immediately called for a brandy, which he gulped down eagerly. Where's Green, he asked as he put the glass down from his mouth. Haven't seen him since supper time, Matthew said. Is he in his room? Uh, like enough he is. Was Judge Lyman here tonight, would he asked. Yes, he ranted on for half an hour about the temperance, as usual, and then Matthew nodded towards the door, leading to the upstairs rooms. Haven't started towards the door, then he realised Mr Harrison was glaring at him. He hesitated and turned back to the bar. He quietly asked Matthew, Do you know where Harrison would have to go if he wanted to find the boys? Yes, Matthew winked knowingly. Where are they? Upstairs. Does old man Harrison know of this? I don't think so. He's not sure, so he's waiting for them to come in. Do they know he's here? Oh, very likely. So everything is fine, then? It's all okay. If you want to see them, tap at number four. Matthew said. Hammond waited a few minutes, leaning on the bar without looking across the room to Mr. Harrison. Then he got up and left through the door leading into the road. Mr. Harrison left soon afterwards. I was tiring of the dissolute conversation in that cursed bar room, so I went outside. There wasn't a single cloud in all the sky, and the moon, which was almost full, seemed to glow more brightly than normal. I had not been sitting long in the porch before that same lady whose movements had attracted my attention the previous evening, made an appearance. She slowly approached the pub. When she came to the door, she waited for a moment to look in, then went on until she disappeared. That poor mother, I thought to myself, when I saw her return again. She was walking slowly, and this time she came closer to the house. My pity was so strong that I failed to restrain it. Who are you looking for? I asked gently. I could see she was frightened when I spoke to her, as she stepped back from me. The moon was shining on her face, showing every anxious line. She was middle-aged, and life and distress had left their marks on her beautiful face. I saw her lips moving, but at first I couldn't understand her words. Did you see my son tonight? 
They say he comes here, she said. The way she whispered the words sent cool chills down my spine. I wondered if her mind was confused. Uh, no, I don't know. I might have seen him, I replied. The tone of my voice must have given her cause to trust me, for she came up to me and her nose bent towards me. It's a terrible place, she whispered. And they say he's in there. The poor boy. He's not like he was. Yes, I think it's a really bad place, I said. I moved a couple of steps towards her. Come, it would be better for you to go home as soon as you can. But if he's here, I said, not moving any closer, we can save him, you know. I'm sure you won't find him. He may be home by now. No, he isn't, she said. But she shook her head in distress. My prodigal doesn't come home until late in the morning. I'll look inside the bar room. I'm sure he's here. Tell me his name and I'll search for him. After some hesitation, she said, His name is Willie Hammond. Oh, that name, said so sadly and with such motherly love, made me scared and horrified. If your son is in the house somewhere, I said decisively, I'll go and get him for you. And I left her to go into the bar. In which room will I find Willie Hammond? I asked Matthew. He looked at me impatiently, but he said nothing. The question was obviously unwelcome. Is he in Harvey Green's room, I asked. I don't know for sure. I don't think he's in the house. I myself saw him go outside about an hour and a half ago. What room is Green in? Number 11, he replied. In the upper part of the house? Yes. I didn't ask any more questions, but hurried to number 11, where I banged on the door. But no one answered. I listened, but I couldn't hear the slightest noise. I called again, louder. I thought I heard a clink of silver, no sound of voice or movement. I was disappointed, but quite sure that there was someone in the room. Then I remembered hearing that gaps were visible through a tear in the curtain that covered the window. I hurried down and out into the road in front of the house. There I found the distressed mother, still walking back and forth. We looked up at the window, which I knew to be Green's room. We could see a clear light through the tear in the curtain. I hurried back into the house and up to number 11. This time I shouted out in an authoritative voice and banged to make them listen to me. What's all that noise about? said a voice within, which I recognised as Harvey Green. I knocked upon the door again, even louder. This time I heard whispering and some awkward movements. The door was unlocked. It was Green who opened it. His body filled the open space so I couldn't see inside. When he saw I was there, he looked offended. What do you want? he asked aggressively. Is Mr. Hammond there? If he is, he's wanted downstairs. No, he's not here, was the short answer. Why do you want him? The fact is that I believe he's acting the fool in your room, I answered bluntly. Green was trying to close the door on my thigh when some person put a hand on his shoulder and whispered something in his ear that I couldn't hear. Who wants to see him? he asked. I immediately realised that Hammond was in the room and said in a loud voice, His mother! The door opened with a bound, and Willie Hammond stood before me, his face as red as fire. Who says my mother is here? he asked. I have just come from her, I said. You will find her pacing back and forth in front of the pub. With a tremendous leap, he rushed past me and hurried downstairs. As the door opened, I saw there were others apart from Green and Hammond inside. I could see Slade and Judge Lyman. The scattered cards on the table told me exactly what was going on. I followed Hammond and met him at the gate coming off the road. You have deceived me, sir, he said angrily. No, sir, I replied. I told you nothing but the truth. Look, there she is, over there. He turned his eyes and saw his mother and jumped towards her to take her in his arms. Oh, mother, mother, what brought you here? He said in a gentle way. Oh, Willie, Willie, I heard her answer. They tell me you come here every night and I couldn't stand by and do nothing. Oh, dear, I could kill you. And I know they will. Oh, don't keep doing this. I didn't hear the rest of her words, but I could hear her heartbreaking voice continue for some time as they walked away together. Within a few minutes they were out of my sight. About two hours later, when I was entering my room, a man rushed past me. I looked towards him and saw it was Willie Hammond. 
he was going back to Green's room. That's the end of the twelfth episode of Ten Nights in the Black Lion, written by Daniel Owen. It was first published in the magazine Charles Abala on August the 25th, 1859. I'm Robert Lomas, and I spent the last year translating this. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please click the subscribe box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen.